Hi everyone, this is my summary for unit six. So let me bring up the examples that I'm gonna talk through. <clears throat> so unit six is um, really for the most part about an interaction between an employer and an employee. Uh, and how do we kind of, or how does the employer decide what wage level to offer the employee for a job? But the, the bigger picture is an employer-employee relationship is one example of a principal-agent problem where the principal wants the agent to do something. Um, and the problem is that the principal can't kind of guarantee that the agent will do exactly what the principal wants. Now, ideally, what the principal would do, what the employer would do, uh, is to get the employee to sign a contract and that contract would stipulate exactly what the employee or what the agent has to carry out. But a common problem we face um, in, you know, in all and like lots of different aspects of the world in employer employee relationships. And we'll talk about more later on is that it's impossible to have a complete contract, a contract which stipulates everything that should happen in every particular circumstance. And I'm just going to run through some of the reasons why why it's impossible to have a complete contract and, and why we often have incomplete contracts. So the first information is not verifiable. So quite often, you know, it'll be very, very hard to monitor every single thing that's going on, say in a workplace, every single thing that the employee is doing um, and to kind of monitor it and like quantify it. And because of that, that information couldn't then be sort of tested in a court of law. And so if there was some sort of dispute, there'd be no way for a judge or a jury to decide, well, who's right, who's wrong. Second reason why we might have an incomplete contract is these notions of time and uncertainty that how are we going to know uh, what, what the employer will, will require the employee to do tomorrow or next year or three years from now? And it's impossible to write in what the employee, what the agent should do under every single possible future circumstance. So there's another reason why we have an incomplete contract. Third is this idea of measurement, right? In the past, it might've been really, really easy for an employer to say, well, your job is to produce this many kind of items of clothing per hour, right? That's the target you have to hit, very, very easy to measure. But in lots and lots of service industries now, and even some goods industries, very difficult to do that very difficult to like quantify exactly the amount that should be produced, exactly what the out output should be. Um, and, and also we can think, think on top of this that a lot of, a, a lot of workplaces now have people working in teams and the output is a consequence of the team's kind of collaboration. So measuring that the, the input of each individual, really difficult. Uh, then this kind of goes along with the, the verification. What if we don't any to do the verification what if we don't have a judiciary we don't have judges or courts then who's going to enforce the contract and then the final one is actually the people involved might prefer not to have this kind of complete contract so i mean i gave this example earlier on where what if uh, like this idea of monitoring every single thing that the worker is doing all throughout their work day that actually the worker might just completely say, no, no, I'm not accepting that. And so there's no way they'd even take that contract. And so the worker might just prefer, and therefore the employer might prefer to have an incomplete contract because, because they wouldn't be able to hire anyone if they asked for every single moment of every single day to be monitored. So these are some reasons for there to be incomplete contracts. And what we are gonna focus in on now is a, the specific example of an employer and an employee and thinking about a model that's going to allow us to figure out um, what would be the wage that the employer would offer in order to sort of maximize their utility. And we're gonna think about the employer maximizing their utility by minimizing their cost, minimizing the, well, yeah, I'll just leave it at that for now, minimizing their cost. So the first thing that comes into our thinking is this idea of employment rent. And what we mean by employment rent is what is the sort of net benefit of having a job and therefore what would be the net cost of losing a job. So 
the first things that come into costs um, of actually having a job, uh, the disutility of work, right? So you might not enjoy doing the actual work and that might actually, you might prefer to have some free time. So that's a cost of having a job. Uh, another cost potentially is like the cost of commuting. Um, and that could be like the actual monetary cost, but then maybe like it kind of impinges on your happiness to have to travel to work every single day. So these are some costs of working. Um, and then in terms of the benefits of working, well, we've got the obvious one, which is wage income, right? The pay get, which then allows you to go out and consume goods. Uh, there might be some firm specific assets, meaning kind of positives that are specifically linked to that firm. Uh, so workplace friends it gives or proximity to, to your home, things like that. You might also be getting some medical insurance through the employer. So that's another benefit. There might be some status assigned or like associated with that job. So these are just a few of the possible benefits of having a job. These are a few of the costs of having it. And we, what we would want to do ideally is sort of weigh up these two things to give us an idea of the value of having a job, right? The employment rent. And the value of having a job is therefore the sort of cost of losing that job. Now, what we do next is to kind of strip this back quite a lot and just think of a very, very simple way of working out an employment rent. And so we have this example here of Maria. And what we think about is this setup where we're sort of at time zero here, okay? And at time zero, uh, Maria could decide to keep her job, her job that pays her 12 hours, uh, sorry, pays her $12 per hour, or she could decide to quit her job. And what we're gonna do is kind of trace out, well, what's, what is her income, um, her sort of net income from each of these different paths? So the blue line here shows us, well, if Maria today at time zero does not quit her job or lose her job, then over the next 44 weeks, and I'll come back to why that's important in a second, she is going to earn this hourly wage of $12 per hour, okay? Um, so why 44 weeks? So this is an assumption that we've put in here that the expected duration of employment is that 44 weeks. So over this 44 weeks, and she works a 35 hour week, so a total of 1,540 hours, if she kept her job, she would earn $12 an hour for that number of hours, okay? So, we're not taking into account any other benefits of employment, just the wage. Now, if she quit or lost her job at time zero, then for those 44 weeks, she would earn nothing because uh, there's no unemployment benefit here, right? We've taken that away. We've assumed there's nothing. So she'd earn nothing for those 44 weeks. And then at the end, we're assuming she would then get another job and that job would pay $12 per hour, right? So, okay. In theory, then, the employment rent should just be the difference between how much she would earn if she kept her job um, minus how much she would earn if she doesn't keep her job. And, and we kind of, if we track the red line, then that's like nothing, right? She wouldn't earn anything. However, what we also need to take into account here is that she does experience some disutility of effort, right? And we put a dollar value on that. So we say that she experiences a disutility for every hour of effort equivalent to $2 per hour, okay? And so obviously if she did not have a job, she wouldn't experience this disutility. So what we do to kind of take this, this, into, this into account is we look at the employment rent per hour. So the benefit of being employed, $12 per hour, the cost of being employed, $2 per hour. So the difference between those, which we'll call the employment rent per hour, the net benefit of being employed, 12 minus two is 10, okay? And so over the course of 44 weeks, if she kept her job, she would earn $10 per hour, multiply that by 1,540 hours, the number of hours, if she works a 35 hour week for 44 weeks, and we multiply that, that out and, and that would give us a value of her employment rent over this whole period. $10 is the employment rent per hour. And then multiply that by the number of hours that she would work. Um, while, say, if she quit, she'd wait that number of hours for a new job. 
that then would give us the total employment rent, the total value of, of Maria's job. All right, and you can see the blue area is representing that idea. So that's like a very, very simple example of how we could work out employment rent. And really simple because we're saying the only benefit is the $12 per hour. The only cost is the $2 per hour of this utility of effort. So if we now jump to a slightly more complicated example and slightly more complicated only because what we now add in is the possibility of unemployment benefit. And very, very importantly here, we assume that the unemployment benefit will last for the entire duration of unemployment, right? Now, why I say that's very, very important is that means the reservation wage, okay? The reservation wage, which is what would be the minimum wage that Maria would um, take a job at uh, and put in no effort for that job. In this case, that's going to be equal to the value of the unemployment benefit, right? But that's not always going to be true. It's only true here because she would get that $6 per hour unemployment benefit for the whole duration of unemployment. Now, if that $6 per hour of unemployment benefit started to like kind of lower and lower and lower over these 44 weeks, then the reservation wage would not be equivalent to that $6 an hour. It would actually be equivalent to less because in Maria's mind, she's kind of thinking, well, the longer I stay unemployed, the smaller this unemployment benefit is going to get. So actually, I might be willing to accept a job maybe right now that's only, say, $5 per hour because I know my unemployment benefit is going to get lower and lower and lower. So just be careful with that. Reservation wage and unemployment benefit are not necessarily equal to each other. In fact, they're only equal to each other if the unemployment benefit lasts for the entire duration of your unemployment. So coming back a little bit, how is this presence of this unemployment benefit going to have an impact on the, um, on the employment rent? Well, we do the same thing as before. We're at time zero. And if Maria keeps her job, doesn't lose her job for the 44 weeks of unemployment, she's going to get that $12 per hour, okay? Um, and then, well, what if she quits her job or she loses her job? Well, in that case, now she's actually gonna get $6 per hour, right? So $6 per hour for that entire 44 weeks. And then we're again assuming that at the end of the 44 weeks, she'd get a job again at $12 per hour, okay? And then we also need to take into account the disutility of effort, right? So the disutility of effort is um, still $2 per hour. So if we kind of think this through, well, we want to work out the employment rent per hour. Well, if she keeps job, she gets $12 per hour, okay? But then what we need to do is subtract $2 per hour because th this is a cost, right? This is the cost of the disutility of effort. And then what we also need to do is subtract six away from that. And what we can think of here, so this is the value of the unemployment benefit. We can kind of think of, well, if she keeps her job, she loses out on a possible $6 of unemployment benefit. And so what that tells us is the actual net benefit of being employed is the $12 she gets minus the cost of the disutility of effort, minus the cost of losing out on unemployment benefit, and it would work out as $4 per hour. So per hour, the net benefit of having a job is just $4. And you can see that's why we have this gap here between the 12 and the eight. Uh, and other than that, we could work out the total employment rent the same way that I talked about before, where we take that employment rent per hour and just multiply by the number of hours that she would be unemployed for, which is the 1,540. And that would give us our employment rent uh, in this particular scenario. So employment rent is obviously important from the employee's side because they want to weigh up, you know, what's the value of keeping this job? But in terms of now figuring out, well, what would the employer do uh, in terms of setting the wage? We actually need two new ingredients 
to figure that out. So the first one is what's called the employee's best response function or best response curve. And what this does is it shows us um, the, well, it shows us for different wage levels, how much effort per hour the employee would be willing to put in, All right? So a couple of points marked out here. So at J, what that's, what J, point J shows us is if the worker was offered a wage of $12 per hour, they would put in 0 0.5 units of effort per hour. And what the way we think about the 0 0.5 is that means we're assuming that the person per hour would only actually work for 30 minutes, right? They'd only actually put in effort for a half of, of, of an hour. Um, and then if we go to, to point K, well, we see there that if they were offered a wage of $24 per hour, they'd put in an effort of 0 0.8, uh, which, which kind of corresponds to them working for 80% of an hour. So that's kind of what you'd expect. If you offer a person a higher wage, they'd be willing to put in more effort. But a really important thing we see with this best response function is to begin with, um, when we say go from $6 to $7, you would see quite a big jump up in effort. So like at low wages, a small increase, a $1 increase in the wage gives a big increase in effort. Uh, but when we get to higher wages, say at 24, if we go from 24 to 25, again, a $1 increase, we get a much smaller increase in effort. So we see this sort of diminishing, uh, diminishing increase in effort at higher wage levels. And the, the best response function, we sort of assume that as we go to higher and higher wages, the level of effort per hour will get closer and closer and closer to one meaning like closer and closer and closer to the person working the entire hour, um, but maybe never actually reach it, that they might need like an incredibly high wage to, to convince them to work like every hour of every day, like full on. Um, so the other thing you can see here, which is, which is important, is we can think of the slope of the best response function as a marginal rate of transformation. Because what it's telling us is, say here at 12, for example, um, if I offered this worker uh, one, one extra dollar, if I offered them $13 per hour, how much extra effort would I get from them, All right? That's what the slope of this is supposed to represent. How much extra effort I'd get if I offered one more dollar at this point. And, and K is the same sort of thing. So why is it a marginal rate of transformation? Because we're thinking, of the transformation from wage into effort, right? So the slope of the best response function tells us about that transformation. How much extra effort do I get for every extra um, dollar that I offer the worker? So this is the first key ingredient in working out what the, the kind of optimum will be in this case. The second really key ingredient is what's called an ISO cost line for effort. So ISO cost, all right, that term ISO means the same, all right? So ISO cost means a line that shows you uh, the same cost, okay? And that's what these three different lines are supposed to be showing us, right? So let's take this, this lowest one for a second. So the idea is this line shows us a combination of wage and effort that's going to give the firm a, so every combination along this line leads to, actually, let me just pause for a second, just to kind of really clarify this in my mind before I say it. Okay, I'm back. I think I've got this really clear in my mind now. So each ISO cost uh, effort line is showing us combinations of a wage and a level of effort that would give the firm a constant cost of effort per hour, all right? So to take this line as an example, so if they chose this point down here, that's quite a low wage, but they get quite a low effort, all right? Uh, whereas they could actually choose maybe this point up here where they get more effort, but they pay a much higher wage. And the link between these two points is the cost of effort per hour is the same at these two different points. And in fact, is the same everywhere along this line. So the cost for the firm 
of effort per hour is the same at every point along this line. And the different lines show us uh, different levels of cost of effort per hour. And in fact, the steeper the line is, the lower the cost of effort per hour to the firm. And this is what the firm is aiming for, right? They want the lowest possible cost to them to get the highest possible effort per hour. So one way we can see this really clearly is if we kind of focus on, well, like $10 per hour, right? So if we look at this line here, for this particular ISO cost effort line, $10 per hour would get an effort of 0 0.45 um, per hour. But on this higher one up here, that same dent $10 would get 0 0.7 level of effort per hour. So they're paying the same amount of money, but getting more effort per hour. And that's why these steeper lines are showing us like better situations for the firm where they're getting more effort for the same cost, right? Which is good for them. They want as much possible effort at as low possible cost. So from the firm's perspective, they've got, you know, a whole map, a whole like series of different ISO Costa lines for effort. And from their perspective, they want the steepest possible one, right? They want the one that is kind of furthest over here because the steeper it is, the cheaper the cost of effort per hour for them. And in fact, you can actually see, we've got our like classic term here. We think of the slope of these lines as a marginal rate of substitution. So why? Because we think of the slope of this as the firm's willingness to kind of substitute a higher wage for more effort per hour. So like each of these lines, shows us like the firm's willingness to kind of trade off wage, or I shouldn't say trade, to substitute wage for effort per hour. And the reason why it's useful to think of MRS here and what we thought of MRT before is because to figure out what the firm should do, we apply the same sort of reasoning that we've seen you know, several times now. So what we're doing here is from the firm's perspective, we are trying to optimize but in this case, we're not trying to make something bigger, right? We're not trying to make utility as high as possible. From the firm's perspective, optimizing means minimizing the cost, right? Minimizing the cost of effort per hour. So how do we find the optimal point? Well, we think about the red curve. That's our best response curve, best response function. This is our constraint here, right? Because the firm could offer combinations of effort and wage that are like anywhere over here, right? That's all, that's all happy, that's all fine for the, for the employee, for the worker. And the, the curve shows us the sort of limit, right? The, the kind of feasible frontier for the worker's effort and wage. And so this, the red line is the constraint. We've got a whole set of blue curves that represent different uh, levels of cost of effort per hour. And so what the firm is going to do is choose a wage level where they have a ISO cost line, which is a tangent to the best response curve, because that's going to mean they are choosing the ISO cost effort line, which is uh, as steep as possible, right? Which is as far to the left over here as possible, which means it's their lowest cost. And that's why you can see that this line is labeled the minimum feasible cost. And so we can see in this case, that would be to set a wage of $12 per hour and they'll get an effort of 0 0.5. I mean, it doesn't seem ideal, but that is the optimum that they can do it with this particular best response curve uh, of the worker. One thing to point out just before uh, I kind of move on and talk about the best response curve a little bit more is you can see that this point here is labeled the reservation wage. And that goes along with what I said before, which is, this is the wage where the worker would just accept the offer of working, but then they would put in no effort, right? Uh, and that's what we mean by a reservation wage. Like what's the minimum wage the worker would accept so that they take the job, but then not put any effort in. So um, we'll, we'll kind of come back to this reservation wage in, in a little bit, um, but I just wanted to point out that's how we can kind of spot it from a best response curve. So final thing on this, model actually is well what's going to change the worker's best response curve 
And actually here, there's, there's a whole host of factors which could do that, right? We've, we've seen this in like the tutorials and in the homeworks that, so the red line here, this middle one represents the, the status quo, the current situation, right? So this shows us right now what the worker's uh, willingness would be to, to kind of trade off or to transform wage into effort, right? Now, uh, let's take uh, this curve over here, all right? So this one over here, we see that now the government's offering higher unemployment benefit, right? And we're saying that that is going to shift our best response curve over to the right. That makes perfect sense because now that there's a higher unemployment benefit, workers would fear losing their jobs less. And in fact, the employment rent would actually fall, right? And as a result, we see two changes. We see a higher reservation wage compared to before. Now, that makes sense. If unemployment benefit is, is higher, uh, we don't, and, and nothing's changed about the duration of unemployment, you would expect a higher wage to, to just like, take the job, okay? But the second change we see is that now the curve is, uh, is kind of scaled down a bit, right? So compared to the red one here, at every wage level, the worker is putting in less effort per hour than before. And again, that's because they're less worried about losing the job because if unemployment benefits higher, the employment rent is smaller. And so they're, they're, they don't wanna work as hard because they're less worried about losing that job. Now, the other change we see is to go to the orange curve here. And we see this is what happens when so forget about there being higher unemployment benefit. Now we're going back to the status quo, but from the status quo, we now have a higher level of unemployment, right? So from the worker's perspective, if you have a job, but you see that there's a really high level of unemployment, you're thinking, well, now if I lose my job, it's gonna take me longer to find a new one because there's quite a lot of people already unemployed. So as a result, my job is worth more to me now. Um, and the kind of, kind of consequence for that is you would, at every wage, be willing to put in a higher level of effort per hour than you were before. Because your employment rent is higher, you are more worried about losing your job. Now, the other interesting thing that's happened is that the reservation wage is lower. So that tells us if you did end up losing your job, now that like your unemployment is going to last for longer. You're kind of thinking, well, I don't want to be unemployed for this really, really, really long time because there's so many other people out there unemployed. I am going to take a job at a much lower wage than I would have before, right? So my reservation wage, the wage that I would just accept the job but not put any effort in, that's going to be lower now that I'm worried about um, getting a new job if I do lose it. So those are just a couple of factors that can come into play uh, that can have an effect on the best response curve. There are lots and lots of others. So keep a like very open mind if you get presented with a question about, about this, about this labor discipline model and about best response curves. There's lots of things that can have an impact on uh, so the reservation wage level, right? But on also the, uh, the kind of level of effort per hour for different wages. So we, we kind of constantly have seen throughout assignments and homeworks shifts to the left, but also and shifts to the right, but then also a kind of scaling up and scaling down. Okay, there are two quick things I wanted to then add on that I think are important. Um, one, I think is just quite an interesting kind of idea to kind of keep in mind that, that something useful that this model actually tells us. And the second is something important for later on in the course. So before I get into them, I'm just gonna take a, a quick pause um, and then I'll come back and talk about these two things. Okay, so final two things I wanted to just run through. So one is that this labor discipline model actually tells us that there has to be involuntary unemployment uh, in the job market. By that, I mean that there will be people who don't have a job, but who do want one. And why does this model show us that? Well, if we imagine that we were in a situation where the equilibrium wage was $12 per hour, right? But where it was possible for you to very easily to kind of quit your job or lose your job and then immediately get another job at $12 per hour. So 
from the employee's kind of perspective, you'd be thinking, well, I'm not going to put any effort into my job, right? Because I can lose this job and then tomorrow get another job at the same wage. So I have no incentive to put any effort in, right? Now, from the employee employer's perspective, this is really bad because all they're going to have is just a bunch of workers who are going to put in no effort. So what's their kind of rational response to that? Well, the rational response is to increase wages, okay? Because the only way they're going to get more effort per hour is if they offer a higher wage. So if they offer, say, a wage of $16 per hour, well, let's think about what has to happen. Assuming that the costs, the, the spending that the firm is going to do on hiring workers, if that's not going to change, if that, say, has to stay constant, if they offer a higher wage, they're not going to be able to employ the same number of workers. So what's going to happen? We're going to have some workers who are now going to be unemployed. And so we get into a new equilibrium where the wage now is higher than it was before, but the consequence is there are fewer jobs available. And as a result, there are going to be people who are unemployed. And now those people who are unemployed, they see that the equilibrium wage is $16 per hour. And so they would be willing to wait and stay unemployed until they could get a job at that wage. And so we end up with there being some involuntary unemployment. Um, and if we ever got back to a situation where people could just jump around again, then put no effort in and just jump between job and jo job to job to job, then the wage would have to go up again in order to get us out of that situation. So the model kind of shows us something that you know, we, we know happens in everyday life, that there are people who stay unemployed for long periods of time. So the other thing I wanted to talk about, and this is really something that comes back again later on in a later unit, is this employer-employee example that we went through was just one type of principal agent problem. And principal agent problems, one of the kind of big features of them is this idea of there being a hidden action. So there is something that the principal wants the agent to do, but they cannot completely monitor every single thing, right? So here, the action that's hidden and that couldn't be covered in the contract is, well, the quantity of work, quality of work, yeah, both of those things might be quite difficult to measure for the employer, right? And so we have this hidden action, the employee, like how do we get them to do high quality work and to do a lot of work and you saw the answer here was to pay this higher wage, right? To have to pay a high wage that incentivize higher levels of effort. But we see this happen in lots of different economic interactions. We have a banker and a borrower. And in this case, well, does the bank know for definite that the borrower is going to repay? No, they don't. Uh, do they know that the borrower will be, so prudent conduct will kind of be doing the best they possibly can in order to make sure they repay the loan? The bank can't know that. But kind of a possible solution to this is that the bank could put into put it could basically do a credit history check, check on this person's previous behavior when they borrowed money uh, to see like, well, is this a good idea? Another example, owner and manager. And so the owner wants maximization of profits. The manager maybe doesn't have a great incentive to make that happen, right? That they're going to get their wage regardless. Uh, and so this action's hidden. Like, how does the owner know that the manager is doing everything possible to maximize profits? They don't. Again, a solution to that. Maybe the manager gets a bonus if the profits are really high, if they exceed the previous year's profits. That could be a good way to align their interests. Landlord and tenant, we see that the landlord wants their apartment to be well taken care of, uh, but the tenant, do they have an incentive to do that? Uh, again, simple solution. Uh, that has been that's employed all the time. The landlord takes a security deposit um, and they won't give that back to the tenant until they've checked the state of the apartment when the tenant's going to move out. So that gives the tenant an incentive to take care of the apartment. Insurance company and insured person, I think this is the last one I'll kind of talk through. You can think of the others, uh, think through the others yourselves, but this one's interesting. So an insurance company and the person who's insured the insurance company obviously doesn't want to have to pay out loads and loads of uh, insurance payments to say like if this is car insurance to pay for like repairs to damaged cars and things 
So they want to encourage the insured person to behave prudently. The insured person doesn't really have an incentive to do that. Uh, so what could the insurance company do? Well, they do things like, you know, offer uh, reward payments for no claims, right? So if the, the person who has the car insurance doesn't make a claim for five years, they get a bit of money back, right? Or they're going to get like a, a lower rate in future for their car insurance. So that's another way to kind of solve these kind of problems. So just wanted to talk about that because it's going to come back again in a later unit. But that is where I will stop with this summary. Uh, again, hope it was really, really helpful. And let me know if you've got any questions that stem from it.